Hello, and welcome to Sandhill's third and final webcast on GDPR, Enterprise Architecture Impact. In this webcast, we will focus on enterprise governance. Please make sure to visit our YouTube channel, Sandhill Consultants, to view our previously posted recordings of part one and part two. During our webcast series in part one, we talked about data architecture. In part two, we talked about application architecture. In this final part three, we're pulling together everything with uh, data governance, which includes network and security architecture. I'll be introducing our two presenters shortly who will be speaking on today's webcast, but first a few housekeeping notes. This webcast is being recorded, and we will follow up by sending out a link of the recording to all attendees in the coming days. In addition, if any attendees have any questions, please use the dialog box to submit questions. At the end of the webcast, we will include the answers to all the questions on our follow-up communications. And as this is the final webcast, one lucky viewer will win uh, a new golf driver. The winner will be announced at the end of the webcast. With that, let me introduce the two speakers on the call. We have two very knowledgeable data management professionals with us on the call today. Don Salisbury, who is our certified CMMI, DMM, EDME, and is Sandhill Consultants Vice President of Architecture Strategies. Don has been the forefront of metadata intelligence for many, many years. And introducing Jog Raj, who is a principal architect from our Santos UK group. Jog is a key practitioner in the field of data management and enterprise architecture. And of course, you're listening to Robert Lutton, Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer, Santos Consultants North America. I'd also like to introduce today's technology partner, Erwin, in our final webcast series. When it comes to data modeling, Erwin is the first name that comes to mind a trusted name in the modeling industry for over 30 years. In today's webcast, we will be showing Erwin EA Agile and the Erwin Data Governance Web Portal as part of the enabling technologies to support GDPR. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Don to start the agenda. Thank you, Robert. As you can see by the countdown clock, we have 240 days five hours and 36 minutes until GDPR will become into force. That's basically approximately eight months before things are going to happen. So as Robert had mentioned, this is part three of a three-part series we've been working on with the GDPR. And you'll notice a part one was all about the critical data elements, the identification and classification of your personally identifiable and sensitive information. In part two, we started to look at the processes, talking about privacy by design, and consent verification. And this third part, we're going to look at enterprise governance by looking at the accountability for the private and sensitive data, what happens in the case of data breaches, and some information about data erasure and data portability. And more specifically, we'll also look at the data maturity model from the CMMI Institute and the supporting processes that are associated with data governance to effectively manage the risk associated with non-compliance to the regulation. So let's start with a basic general overview of the General Data Protection Regulation. It is actually was implemented in May 2016, but the European group has given two years for corporations to become prepared because enforcement actually takes place in May of next year. There's three real major components to this that are relative to the parties that are involved. The first and foremost is the data subject, and that is the, the individual member of the European member nations that is the, actually the individual that is has the private and personally identifiable information. Secondly is the data controller, and that's the party or an, and individual that says how and why personal data is processed when it is collected by an organization. A data processor is a further component of that, which is basically an organization that acts on the controller's behalf. But it's important to understand that the data controller is ultimately responsible for the collection and use of the data, even if it is by a data processor. 
So if we look at the guiding principles associated with the regulation, it basically speaks to the rights of individuals and their personally identifiable and sensitive data. The notion of that then is that all systems that collect and manage this data must have data privacy built into them by, de by design and in fact should be the, the default. The other part around this of course is grounds for lawful processing, which means that in every contract between an individual and an organization, there is a notion then that only the data can be collected and utilized for the specific process that was contracted between the individual and the organization. And beyond that, of course, would be in the notion that only should happen if there is consent provided by the data subject. And the secondary important part of that too is when breaches happen to that information, that the the person, the individual, the data subject is directly informed. So what we've seen here is really the transfer of personal data in systems to the rights of the individual. And what we're talking really is about data ownership and control. And that is now passing from the organizations that collect and manage the data to the individual. So you can think now of an individual data subject as actually owning the copyright of the information that is personal and sensitive. Really in what we're talking about then is going from data protection as we've seen a lot of press on recently to more about data privacy. So what is data privacy in terms of traditional risk management? Well, as we saw in part one, as we looked at the data component, the data architecture, the what, if you will, of personal and private data, that we talked about the classification of it, the private and sensitive data, and the level of valuation, the critical data elements. In part two, we talked about the applications, the how, which relates to detecting things about breaches and where they happen, because typically they happen through an application. So understanding now the relationship of the application to data. And in this third section, we're gonna look at mitigation, which frankly is about enterprise governance, which now connects all of the four major architectures from the data architecture, the application architecture, or security architecture, and network architecture. So as we look at the problem now, we realize what we're talking about is an entire data ecosystem that is founded on metadata that essentially starts with the individual up at the top through a series of models, which we saw in the first session we did around conceptual data models, logical data models for transaction systems, and logical and physical data models for analytic systems. And in the middle, we see this thing called shared data that effectively becomes the management of the master data and the critical data elements. So what we now have is this complete ecosystem that from the individual going to the collection of data through the processing, heading into things like data warehouses and business intelligence with this historical transformation that all of this should be now a closed loop of metadata. So let's look at the first aspect that we talked about here about data privacy within an enterprise governance perspective and it's that of accountability. So when we talk about accountability, again, we talk about the technical organizational measures that ensure and demonstrate compliance. And this is on an individual basis of the data controllers and data processors, but also at an organizational level. Critically, what is important to understand then, that there needs to be transparency and documentation on the processing, whether consent was, was applied with explicit consent and where appropriate, as I said, to appoint a data protection officer. But very clearly, there has to be the notion that a data controller has to be an individual within an organization that is accountable for the privacy. And the measures by which that can be done, typically, is the most important one is data minimization that says you will only collect data sufficient to provide the lawful processing of a transaction. And some of the other things we've looked at as well as pseudonizing, and anonymizing or masking or camouflaging data. Ultimately, what it needs to provide is the transparency to allow a data subject to understand how their information is collected and how it is processed. And that is precisely what the important part of this activity is, to allow an individual to understand and see compliance, how it is provided by the organization that they have given their data to. And again, obviously creating and improving security features relates directly to the protection aspect as we talk about data security. An important part of this activity will be in the next several years, of course, is doing the impact analysis on the data protection aspects according to the regulation. And the whole notion of doing these assessments around the security will extend to actually assessments of the data itself and the privacy it provided. 
So data minimization really is the biggest answer to what a lot of this has been provided around the regulation. As you can see by the cartoon that the suggestion has always been with implicit consent, you can collect and distribute and frankly profit from an individual's pieces of information. When we talk about accountability then, in the most part we're speaking to structures that are in databases, basically tabular data. So as we look at a database here, we understand that there are columns and there are rows and there are cells. When we look at the data accountability from a metadata perspective, however, we want to look at the structure, if really is the columns, and we're talking about in terms of accounting terms of the form, form and substance being the two aspects from an accounting perspective, but from a metadata perspective, we really are talking about the physical structure of the data that is in tables. In rows, again, looking at the accounting and auditing perspective, we're talking about the life cycle of data. How are each of these rows created and the transaction process that happens to do the updates to the information that is in the database? And again, from an auditing perspective, the key control processes then have to be identified to understand where and how this data is collected and processed and moved through the organization. So really, this is what we talked about in the first two aspects of the presentations as part one and part two is about the structure of the data and about the processes. And part three, we're gonna to not to uh, talk about more about the security and the networking rather than the actual content and substance. So as we look at then, if we talk about structure and life cycle, we talk about the columns and the rows, we really are talking about stewardship, but there are two fundamental differences in the type of data stewards that we're talking about here. St structure in the terms of metadata and, and the columns is really the governance steward. Essentially, the individual and the parties involved are responsible for the decisions about what data the enterprise will collect and maintain. And in this condition, obviously, there's a direct correlation to the data controller because it's the data controller who has to specify and provide documentation as to what data was collected and how it was maintained and put through the systems. So if we look at the second part of this then, we're talking about more of a process steward. This person responsible, power party responsible for decisions about how the enterprise will collect and maintain the data. Now it's an interesting aspect to see the differences between the two because there can be a central governance steward that specifies that the data collected by the organization in question will have the following structure. However, as we've seen by different lines of business or different companies within an organization, how they collect and maintain the data may in fact be different and there must be a different set of processing stewards to understand that this is how, given a standard structure, that they are gonna implement how the data is collected. I'd like to pass over to Jog now. Great, thank you, Don. So uh, as, as Don was talking about um, the collection of the data, um, one of the key things about um, what we're able to understand about uh, the, the processes that are being performed as well as the data is actually uh, at which one of those processes are uh, responsible uh, for creating and reading and updating the, uh, the, uh, the data that we're interested in. And that's key because obviously uh, not all processes are, are um, involved in actually creating the data, which is very important to understand because it's at that point in time that we need to understand have we got the necessary permissions and the authorizations to actually take that information and capture it. Similarly, with uh, reading the information, um, uh, can we use it or repurpose it for different uses? So again, at each stage, we need to be able to understand what it is, is the, the, the actual piece of data and what is the process? And is that a lawful process that uh, is permitted for us? And have we got the necessary permissions to be able to do that? So creating uh, process uh, types of uh, interactions with the data and having some sort of analysis where we can do a create, read, update and delete uh, it enables us to be able to identify who's responsible and doing what for the data. And um, I've just realized on this slide uh, that one of the entries that we're missing on here is a delete. And uh, that is just as important as any other one of the interactions of the process and the data, because obviously the data that we collect has to have a time frame in which it's operational. It can't be kept forever. Uh, it's going to be uh, time scope. So at some particular point in time, the data sh should expire. So with that in mind, um, not only do we need to understand uh, what processes are uh, looking at the data, but the people who are involved, the data stewards and the stakeholders and so on, 
um, they all need to specify and understand what their rights are to the creation of the data. So by that, what we are talking about is uh, for the particular processes, we need to define who is actually accountable for defining what can actually be performed on that data. So this view here is telling us that the metadata steward is responsible for defining uh, the uh, accountable processes for, uh, for uh, reading the data. Similarly, the data modeler here, for example, is going to be consulted. But over here on the left-hand side, what we've got there is the business analyst is the one who's going to be uh, informed, i.e. he will be using the information that is captured as part of the meta models to be able to, to understand who is responsible for um, using the data and in what way it's actually going to be used. And what we're also interested in knowing is having models of the context in which the, the data itself is being used and what data stewards are responsible for uh, collecting that information. So in this view here, which has been taken from um, one of the, the products that we're using here, is in the center is the customer data that we've got. And the customer data has been identified as being one of those personal identifiable pieces of information. And so that's something we're interested in. We're not bothering with the other pieces of data that aren't um, personally identifiable information. But the context in which this is sitting is that it's telling us that the customer data is uh, running on a particular server, being used as part of a particular application. But also more importantly, here are the data steward uh, that is responsible for looking at that data who has been assigned from the customer services organization and that the customer services organization is the entity which has been defined as being a data controller looking after the, 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 uh, the actual data that we've got here. So having the context of the data in, um, in the context of the environment in which it sits in and the stakeholders are that are involved in acting upon that this is obviously of importance. And we can visualize that in these types of models and diagrams that we've got here. Back over to you, Don. Thanks, Jog. And that's critical to understand, obviously, because as we identify the parties that are involved, very critically, the allocation of their security profiles is relative to their uh, responsibility and accountability as it comes to data. Next thing we like to take a look at is the, the concept of breach notification. And as we've seen, obviously, there's risk management associated with data breaches, but critically, one of the most important ones we've seen, obviously, is the notion of reputational risk. And we've seen that very recently. In fact, for a number of security uh, organizations have actually called this the year of the breach. This is where we have seen significant number that make the papers. And there's a, if you'll see by the quote on that, two thirds of Canadian companies, when speaking to their executives, are saying that they're losing the war. Effectively, what they're saying is not if a breach happens, it's when it's going to happen and what do you do to mitigate it when it happens. Well, within the context of GDPR then, uh, the actual act states that the data controller has to notify the data protection agency, which is the country specifically within the European member union, without undue delay and when feasible, no later than 72 hours after becoming aware of a data breach. So if we go back to our looking at our data ecosystem again, we see that in the, in the gray areas down at the bottom, this is actually where a breach happens. And understanding the impact analysis of that breach starting from the applications and databases where it happened. In point of fact, most enterprise data protection is through the secure notion of a security clearance that sits in front of an application level security. And in point of fact, it's very similar to a gated community where a lot of the data protection and security is at the front gate, if you will, rather than understanding inside what is in the view of the data that makes it private. So what often happens then is if there's a breach in application security, it does open the door, if you will, to then getting at the data, irrespective of whether it's part of the transactional systems or it could be part of the enterprise data hub, data warehousing, or analytic systems. And that's the danger of having data protection only from the perspective of the front gate without understanding inside where is all the private data and then understanding that certainly aspects have to change around how you handle the private and sensitive data versus just purely providing application level security. So when the breach happens then, what do you do in terms of impact analysis? 
Well, if we go back then to looking at the different models we talked about in the first two sessions, within our data architecture, we have the bi-directional aspects of going from databases back up to the business terms, and then from an application right back to the business processes. So as we look at the application level security again, we see forensically it happens at the application level, and then what we need to provide in terms of transparency and reporting and documentation is the aspects of what happens post and at a breach to look at the application structure against the databases to see if in fact there is private and sensitive data going right back to the impact analysis at the business term level but just as importantly then to look at the application structures themselves and to understand potentially what the impact is on business processes in fact what has happened in a lot of cases is the walls have been hardened so again taking the aspect of understanding that you're going really from more of a data protection to understanding the data privacy issues is what we're talking to. Doc? Great, thank you, Doc. So, so far we've been talking about how the processes are acting upon the, uh, the actual data and the movement of that data as we're going along. But um, the actual processes might be performing the minutia of the transactions and uh, uh, individual actions on the data but we often want a view uh, which is totally independent of the process view and uh, it's often the case that we want to try to understand how is the data that we've got how is it actually being transformed uh, from uh, the source in which we've obtained it from from where we've collected and how it moves along into uh, multiple different databases or gets transformed or consolidated or refactored for our uh, different purposes. And so there's often a need to actually understand what that data movement is and to be able to trace that back and make sure that what we're actually looking at uh, in terms of the end data is actually the same data that we started out uh, at the beginning. And that data itself, as I say, may have changed um, not on its uh, content, but it may have changed in terms of its label as it gets transformed and, and uh, uh, reused and refactored. But essentially, the fact that it's a di in a different form does not negate the fact that we still need to be able to have uh, permissions to be able to reuse that information. Uh, that's not barring, obviously, pseudonizing and anonymizing the information. We still need to be able to have traceability at which point in time we did uh, uh, um, add pseudonyms for the data and anonymize the data in there. So data movage uh, lineage is very, very important to understanding what the transformation is for the data. And not only, as I say, are we interested in how the data itself gets transformed, but um, we need a detailed picture of the actual processes which act upon that data, what processes are consuming the data at which point in time, what's the order of the flow or the order in which the actions actually happen. So previously, when we were looking at the matrix type of view, where we had the CRUD matrices, uh, we were looking at the actions of the individual processes, but that didn't confer to us the order ordering which it happened. And so ha having an understanding here tells us that uh, we've got a process model view and obviously as part of the process we need to make sure we've collected the correct uh, permissions at the right point in time of the process and um, understand uh, that it has actually been done uh, as part of the process here. Now not, not only is this um, necessary so that we can understand that, that um, uh, the process so we can understand the process, but also to demonstrate compliance at a later point in time, if it, there is either an internal or an external audit, we can explicitly say this is the intent here, this is where we collected the data, this is what we've done with it. So it's not uh, only just useful for our internal purposes, but also for external ones wherever we need to be able to demonstrate compliance um, on, on the data here. Back to you, Don. Thank you, Jack. Next thing we want to look at is the right to be forgotten. And as Jog had mentioned earlier, we often have crew in the CRUD, basically created, reviewed, updated, but frankly, never deleted. In fact, there's a term in the inventory managed business called LIFO and FIFO, which is last in, first out, first in, first out. And a friend of mine described to me as what we do with data very often is fish, first in, still here. And that's one of the big issues that we're dealing with. Although we may have the right to collect it, the question remains then, what is the term by which we can keep and utilize that information? So as the right to be forgotten, again, as a result of the individual having ownership now of their own data, 
it basically allows the data subject to say, we had a contract you collected and used my data for a specific purpose. I want to actually explicitly remove the, con the contract. In point of fact, when you say there's explicit consent, there is the notion then that that consent can be withdrawn. The other part of the right to be forgotten is relative to unlawful processing, and that's got an interesting aspect we're going to be seeing as to a lot of information that is passed along that did not have explicit consent to be used, where the person, the data subject, has found that their information is being used, they can call for the data processing officers, the data privacy officers, to then say that that is a breach, that there is unlawful processing of the individual's data because they did not provide explicit consent. And a lot of that consent, again, has a time frame that we need to look at. The biggest problem that we're going to have, frankly, is going to be in the analytical data that we process. If we look at, again, typical dimensional model, we see here that there's product information, calendar information, location information. But fundamentally, as we start to look at the analytic data, the customer will definitely have some personally identifiable information that is being used in our analytical systems. Again, as what was mentioned before, the two primary ways of doing it is providing pseudonyms to the data, and whereas an attribute or certain information is either masked or camouflaged, or there's the notion of anonymizing, which is taking some person's information or data subject and makes it no longer incidentally identifiable. Now, the incident, the interesting part of that, though, of course, is when you do an aggregation, there is some anonymity in the aggregation in the sense that we're not looking at one person's information, we're looking at the aggregate of people's information. However, the problem exists that even though you pseudonize or anonymize, if algorithmically the information can be traced back to a single individual, a single data subject, the act is still in effect. The result of this we see is when we look at our analysis, particularly in things like dimensional models, I call it observational analytics because basically people have asked me to put a system that provides them with the nth level of detail down to the minutia. The interesting part of that, however, is most of the good analysis happens several points away from the base detail level. In other words, it's not about the SKU or the individual product or the individual person that bought it at a location at a store. It's probably the brand level for multiple products, for multiple regions, for a type of individual who is buying the product. What we found, however, is the fact that when people ask us for the nth detail, it is frankly to assure that when they do a drill down, that the numbers add up. In point of fact, what we've seen is actually people say, well, I can smell bad data because I look at my drill down, and if I see an anomaly out at the higher levels of aggregation in the N minus two minus three levels or greater, I can drill back to the individual minutia to say that, no, that number does not add up because there is some bad data at the lower level. Now, the reason I call this out observational analytics is precisely that. You can humanly observe the information in the aggregate and go down to the nth detail. However, we're moving into an age of algorithmic analytics where it is not going to be humanly possible to drill down to see what the actual minutia is and the metadata to understand where the data anomalies are. So you can imagine the level of data quality that is required to actually be able to do that through an algorithmic level to be able to trust the data coming out the other end. John? Great, so with that data that's been collected though, um, you know, given the sort of transactional nature of everything that's going on these days, where we where data is collected in one geographical boundary, processed or moved to another one, and uh, goods and, and uh, um, data center to another third location, I mean, the the data itself knows no boundaries. But that doesn't mean uh, that the rules and jurisdictions of one province or one geographical location um, are suddenly uh, forgotten simply because of the fact that the data has moved to, into a different um, geographical location. So that gives us an important aspect to be able to, to understand as part of our data, where actually does it reside, where does it um, sit, where is it processed, and what rules and regulations apply to that. So we can't forget about the actual uh, physical geographical location of the data that we've collected and what we're doing to it and where we are doing that processing. So we need to have views which tell us what data has been collected and in our view here 
uh, we've got a view which shows us that the there's a particular database server which is residing in Paris, which is in France, which is in Europe, and therefore our GDPR regulations will apply in there. And again, uh, the focus is not on everything uh, that, uh, that we're collecting, but only on that key um, information which is subject to the GDPR rules. Back to you, Don. Thank you. So the next thing we want to talk about is data portability in terms of the, and not so much the content, but really the context, the metadata associated with the notion of portability. So again, the, the DS, the data subject, has the right to receive personal data concerning him or her in a structured and commonly used machine-readable format. Effectively, what they're saying is, irrespective of how you collect and store the data, there should be a mechanism that allows the data subject to understand in a very clear form what the information is they've provided, what the content they've provided, but more importantly, from a metadata perspective, perspective what is the conditions around around which the data is collected and what was collected. And I remember when I moved the first time, it seemed to me that an infinite number of monkeys at an infinite number of typewriters would in fact get my name and address correct. So what a lot of data portability relates to is the fact of having the notion that I now have a single point of entry for the collection and distribution of my data when I ex express the consent that it is used, and it is used in a consistent form and structure, irrespective of the data systems of the actual companies or enterprises that I deal with. In point of fact, the, the notion of data portability content from a structural perspective is the notion of providing this universal person code that would then be used to have all the format and structure consistently defined, and then that would provide that universal portability across multiple systems. Now that's a uh, daunting task, as you can imagine, that you, we now have to come up with an agreed to structure and form as to what that is going to look like, and frankly, then providing this universal person code, which would give this unique identifier to all data subjects in the European Union. And I think that's gonna be one of the big challenges is actually trying to figure out what this universal code is gonna be that provides that single identifier that allows the data in this form and structure that's consistently stated to then proceed from different systems and different organizations. So we'll take a little more look at that. We're gonna see, go out of jog if you take, take a look at with how the party usage then is related. Great, so what we're talking about here is again, taking the same data that you've got but what are the uh, the actual organizations, well, I guess in our view here, we're looking at the organizations which are the parties which are actually using that data. And again, um, you know, in terms of uh, taking our efforts and investing our efforts, the areas in which the, uh, the data is being used the most are the ones that we should really be um, emphasizing and placing our most attention on, because that's the data which needs to be most critical and important, because obviously it's being used quite a lot. And so the views here are ways of analyzing the models that we've got to help us identify and focus on the key and important uh, data which is being used by the various parties that are involved. Back to you, Don. Thank you. So what we really want to look at then is looking at the regulation from an enterprise governance perspective with, that, with the data in mind as the first priority. Uh, we looked at the, 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 the DMM model, the data ma uh, maturity model from the CMMI Institute, and we looked to the different functions that are associated with the maturity model to do the better job of data governance. In our part one and part two sessions, we talked about the elements of data governance, data quality, platform and architecture and data operations. What we'd like to do in this section now is talk more about the supporting processes that are associated with the data governance support activities. Really so then as we talk about the supporting processes, we're talking about measurement and metrics, process management, quality assurance, risk management, and configuration management. Measurement analysis is pretty much as you can understand it's saying to, to have a measurement capability and analytical technique to support managing and improving data management activities. And again, with specific reference here to the information related to private and sensitive data. So the first aspect of that, frankly, is around data standard, standards. Going back to a statement made by Peter Drucker that you can't manage what you can't measure. Well, let's take a look at what a measurement means. A measurement is really a ratio of an observed incident over a standard. 
And the important thing there is the measurement, absolutely, and the metric is critical to understand, but the denominator, the standard, has to be something that is universally defined that every time you then use that ratio, you have the same ratio that has a standard of an observation over that standard. And that's where, again, from our Sandhill Consultants Group, we have the enterprise modeling set of standards that really you can't measure what you can't define. And it's without those definitions, certainly of data naming standards, data domains, data structure standards, that you can't even start to look at what the measurement would look like. So here's an example from the product that helps you, a data steward, understand what the compliance is to the data standards. And we look at things like the entities, the attributes, the tables, and the columns from the logical and physical models. And we start to look at the information related to them as it relates to things like the naming standards. Do we have a definition? Do we have uniqueness around the entities and attributes? And similarly, the tables and the columns do they adhere to a specific naming standard? The naming standards become very critical in the physical world, obviously, as we now look at data breaches. We need to find that the application codes are attached to which databases, and without the structures of the naming standard, it becomes very difficult to actually find which databases we're talking about, and then again, having them related upwards to the, the logical models and then back to the business terms. Process management. Establish and maintain a usable set of organizational processes, assets, plans, implement, and deploy organizational process improvements. Part of what Jog was saying earlier as well is this is not even so much from a design perspective, but when one gets into a situation where the regulation has been applied and there is a question as to what happened with the data subject's private or personal information, it's very important that you have that asset mapping, you have that transparency of process design to show where in fact the data was collected, how it was processed, and how it was kept. So we look at, again, the CMMI's data maturity model to provide that, and then we look at the levels of maturity going from level one, which is effectively a people-driven process, pretty much at the project level, and try and raise that level from a process management perspective to level two, where you have a set of defined programs and processes. And this is incidentally where the whole notion of having a GDPR program will get you at least an initial part to understand what is the structure required, what are the roles and responsibilities, and fundamentally, as we talk about data controllers and data processors, who are the accountable individuals? And obviously, we'd like to get every organization up to level three, where it becomes a completely enterprise scale repeatable process. Just to give an example of some of the work we've done, we call it wayfinding. Effectively, on your data management roadmap, we start to look at through doing a DMM assessment initially, where you are at a current position. And if we see here on the chart, the first boxes in the kind of grayish area are the levels that was assessed as a result of the assessment. And a lot of them, as you can see, are under the level two, which is meaning it's mostly uh, an organization that is very project driven or application driven. We see then there are a few areas as we moved up into the bluish area that pass level two and are on their way to becoming an enterprise scale. Incidentally, you'll see that the notion of a configuration management is very critical. This is an organization actually that was quite aware of the fact of the risks and reputational risks associated with data breaches, and in fact had a very good configuration management system. But as we start to look at more than just the technical aspects and looked at the business strategies, and the mission statements, we found that there was a need to progress quicker, and that's what you see in the uh, orangey yellow colors, is the fact that there were certain things like the data management function, the funding, metadata management, and data quality and measurement that needed to be at an enterprise scale as quickly as possible. So rather than just saying, here's where you are, and then here's the path to level three, that when we do the data management assessments, we also look at what the mission and goals of the organization are. And to provide that, we are working at Sandhill Consultancy with a product we call the Data Governance Capability Delivery System, which is in effect that roadmap to get you to the level three. And this is a product we're gonna be releasing in the next quarter or so. That is a, uh, a SharePoint based system that is a knowledge base of the information you need to do the level three type of enterprise processing as it relates to data governance within the CMMI. And you can see there associated with it are the number of processes associated with governance management. And then the drop downs again, take you down to the detail level where in the knowledge base, it would then tell you what the 
policies would be the rules and processes and right down to artifacts that would say this is what the workflow would look like or this is what the documents provided to do the level of processing. Obviously, if you're doing a process, you have to understand how well you're doing that. So process quality assurance is quite critical as well. And again, within the CMMI, it's the staff and management with objective insight into the process execution and associated work products. So the two elements there really are about the work products and the quality of the work products that are being produced from the process perspective of doing data governance. So again, here's another example from our enterprise modeling set of standards. This is a workflow for the data stewards. So on this side of the house, again, we're looking at more of the structure of the data and we're looking at the different workflows associated with the data with the data steward's job. And again, this one would be your governance steward that is involved with the actual structure, the metadata of the data and how they are processing it and the different steps involved and the cross-checking as to whether the steps are being performed as it relates to data structure. We also have the data governance portal from the Irwin product line that talks to more of the terminology, the business terms, the glossary work. Again, very similar to the structure. This is more of the governance associated with term business term management in the glossary. And again, we see that the different, the RACI once again, we see the workflow and we see the processes involved and who are the parties that need to do the work. And then within that, again, we see the structure that says this is the work that needs to be done and here is the processing that's involved. So effectively what happens now, as Jog was referring to earlier, we've seen how the data moves across the organization. As we add the data structure lineage, as we add the business term management and the glossary now, we can see we have a different type of lineage that is now I would call the vertical lineage. If you saw before, it was more the horizontal, how does the data flow and move across the organization? We now, with the notion of providing the business information models and the glossary can provide now the semantic lineage that once again, if we need to show to the authorities in, the reg in terms of the regulation, not only this is how the data moved across the system, but this is how we identified it. And again, going back to the notion of data portability, here is how it was defined and structured within our organization. In terms of risk management, again, we saw a little earlier that the basic elements are we have to classify, detect, and mitigate the circumstances around data governance that we need to identify, analyze potential problems in order to take appropriate action and then to ensure the objectives can be achieved. And that's a very critical aspect in terms of project planning and program and portfolio management. Doug? Yeah, great. So Don was just talking about risk management there. So if we want to mitigate our risks, well, how are we going to do that? Are we just going to go in and uh, um, just do, do uh, an analysis of the business and the problems that it's got on an ad hoc basis, or do we do it on a basis of he who shouts the loudest? Well, instead of that, what we need is to have a more um, objective way of being able to focus in on the business capabilities and based on that, be able to go in and to look at what areas we think we should be um, expending our efforts in to get the maximum returns uh, with the minimum amount of effort on there. And one of the ways that we can do this is to start looking at what the capabilities are of the business. And so we have capability models. And as part of the capability models, we can start analyzing and running analytics to help us identify key areas or critical areas that we should really be focusing on. So we can get heat map types of views where we can ask the questions, well, what parts of the business capabilities do we have that are absolutely critical uh, to the business? What parts of the business are underperforming either because there are deficient um, applications or other problems that have been identified with the data or the processes or the organizations? So we can create a heat map view and the heat map view enables us to focus in on the, the key areas that we want to start looking at rather than as a sort of ad hoc basis. So given that, let's say we can focus on a particular area. What we need to be able to do is to understand what we've got currently. And by that, we're talking about what's the uh, key area in terms of the capability that we've got, what applications support that, where do those applications run or what uh, technologies are supporting those, and what are the information and the initiatives and the, uh, the stakeholders which are involved in that. So here we've got some, a couple of key uh, applications that we know uh, that we're going to be working on and investigating. 
But this is stating that the current state, so we know where we are at the moment, but we also need to be able to go to the, to the target state that we actually want to get to. So the future state defines for us what is it where we want to be at some point in time in the future. And again, as um, any uh, project portfolio manager will tell you, well, what's important to you? What are the key features and functionalities that you want? If you want everything, it's going to take X long, but if you want uh, the uh, prioritized uh, features built in here, I can do those in a certain period of time. So we have to perform some sort of analysis uh, in terms of looking at what is it that I must have, should have, and could have, and would like to have, and prioritize on, on that basis. And if on our prioritizations, we come up with a number of projects which we want to implement, well, what's the planning for those projects? So when do we need to, um, what's, the, uh, what's the sequence in which we should be doing those? What are the codependencies? And also, just as importantly, what resources have we got in order to be able to plan and deliver, uh, deliver those particular uh, capabilities that we want? So, what we need to be able to do is to have views which give us the capability, which give us the the uh, the individual project plans. But again, you know, trying to understand and focus in on not just the key areas that of functionality that we want, but also on those areas where we have to have compliance issues as well to be addressed. So again, un trying to understand what are the application components and the sub application components. And what's the plans for those? Are we actually going to be consolidating those applications? Do we continue uh, in the maintenance of those, investing additional funds? And which of those application components are subject to GDPR compliance in there? So who is actually going to be affected by that change in there? So, you know, it's not just simply a case of here's a project, just get on with it. It's a case of having a highly uh, organized and um, uh, objective way of identifying what are the areas that we want to work on and organizing and planning ourselves so that we can deliver to meet the needs of the business in there. Back to you, Don. Which we talk, we, we want to talk now about configuration management, which is effectively the management of that portfolio that Jog was mentioning. So again, establishing, maintaining integrity of the operational environment, configuration, identification, control, status, accounting, and audits. And again, once again, it's going to be critical in the future around these audits because there will be data privacy audits that will be taking place. So really, what we're talking about here is application portfolio management. I'd like to hand it back to Jog now to tell you a bit more about what that entails. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. So uh, application portfolio management then is saying, well, now that we know what our plans are for the, those applications, how are, how are we going to schedule those for those individual applications? What's their life cycles? You know, uh, when do they actually come uh, live? When are they actually going into, uh, into a uh, maintenance mode or are they being retired? So we ha can have uh, application roadmaps which express for us over um, a time horizon what our aspirations and plans are for those particular applications. Not only can we see the applications in terms of a roadmap, but we can also see what the status is of each one of those. And so we have a view which gives us a Kanban lifecycle type of view which says, well, right, here's the actual applications. Here's their status or their um, action plans. Some are proposed, some are in development, and it gives us an opportunity to be able to have a visual representation and a visual understanding of what uh, the application portfolio is over a period of, of time. But not only are we interested in understanding what the applications are, but also what's the broader context in which those applications are sitting. So let's look at the next slide in here. And so when we take uh, the, the actual applications, we can understand, yes, that particular application is handling certain types of data. But again, we can have an impact analysis or a landscape type of view, which tells us, you know, from a governance point of view, for the privacy data governance point of view, here's the piece of data that those applications are, are handling. And what um, technologies, what processes, what business rules, uh, what stakeholders, are important in understanding the context of that particular piece of data that uh, again we're looking at so it's not just about you know understanding the application but being 
aware of the fact that yes, against the applications, we need to understand the data plus the technology so that, that as we're going along and developing these, we're cognizant of the fact that there may be standards which apply, there will be principles and standards and uh, regulations which, we, which apply and that we need to be aware of those. And again, that comes back into governance and that's back over to you, Don. Thank you, Jog. So over the three parts we've done in the webinar series, we hope you can see now that we start with data and then we build this entire level of governance around the regulations by actually understanding where our data is used by what application, what parts of the network, which are going to become very critical to understand because of the fact that the processing may actually happen outside of a member state, yet the governance still has to take place as within the regulation. Security, actually, we hope we've seen some of that related to the accountability and responsibility of individuals and the understanding that the data controllers and data processors need to have the adequate level of security in attaching them to the applications. And then again, by understanding the importance of the privacy of the data to see where the data is, is collected, where it is processed, and who has accountability and access to, the, to that information. So the key questions we hope we've answered over the last three webinars were, what are defined as private data? Why is it required? What is the lawful, lawful processing of it? Where is it stored? And who is, permitted to access, who is permitted to have access to it? In point of fact, what we've been talking about, frankly, is metadata. So it's metadata for all data as we're looking at it. We can see from traditional database management systems that we typically start with the conceptual, logical, and physical models, and then we create the databases. We've also seen that in the data warehouse environment, we have a similar aspect on the source to target mapping that has the models that take it from the transactional systems and put it into the analytical systems. And just as critically now with the rise of big data, we can see that using tools that can actually extract the metadata from the big data environment, we can also create schemas from those. And it's from all these different schemas now that we see we have the form and the substance that comes from the data modeling, the data structure modeling, the data content modeling that comes from our data quality work. And we also see that there's a data systems model that comes from the application architectures that speak to the life cycle. This will allow us to visualize, to measure, and provide metrics for and do monitoring of the data that provides us what we call metadata intelligence around compliance and risk management. Now, it's not the first time we've seen this, of course. There was good old SSY2K from a few years ago that we thought we would have it fixed and understanding what metadata was all about as it relates to Y2K. Well, of course, that boat sailed and metadata never really became a major component of a lot of applications management. Well, there's a new boat in town, the GDPR, and frankly, my gray beard still saying that we should take a look and make sure that we understand the metadata associated with our organizations. So in summary, if you plan to collect personal data and utilize it for processing within the EU, you better have more than purely a gate and a lock at the front, the security technology and a data privacy policy. It is not gonna be enough to understand and provide information to the regulators. What we saw in part one and part two is you need the data models to identify the private data, how it is managed and the structure of it. And we also need to see the flow the process management to see that how it is collected and how it is processed. And I hope you've seen now also in the third part of this webinar series that we're really talking about the blueprint for compliance. Things have to change, how are they gonna change, which order they're done, and how things are gonna happen. Really, how to get started? Well, again, we think the best place to start is having a map to go forward. We think that the CMMI data maturity model is an excellent map. First and most important thing of any good mall as you're there is to look for the little star that says you are here. And that's the identification and classification of your private data. The next thing you got to figure out is where you're going to get to. Understanding that if you're at a level one or a level 1.5 on the maturity model, how do you get to level three? And in point of fact, which of the processes within the maturity model do you need to get to level three? And that's where we look at the thing called wayfinding. And that's part of what we do in our terms of our data management assessment. Not only do we tell you where you are, but we also look to your business plans and where you want to get to, to provide you with that roadmap. And how do you get there? Well, it's enterprise governance and specifically it's enterprise data governance. 
So within the DMM assessment, there are 26 different processes we look at. And rather than a traditional CMMI where you're looking for the one number, we look for the 26 numbers. And in point of fact, we want to help you to get to level three. The power of governance is at level three, where it is an enterprise wide across the organization and you have that level of maturity. And we hope that the enterprise data management expert is the person that can help you get there. Thanks, Don. Uh, and actually, I'd like to thank Don and Jog for their insights on our uh, final webcast uh, series related to enterprise architecture impact for GDPR. Don, just before uh, I kind of do the final wrap up slides, we did have a question. I uh, wonder if you can help us uh, answer this question. Uh, hypothetically, if an organization stores their data in the cloud, uh, where would uh, where would it be considered physically located? Is it physically located where the server farm is? Uh, and the reason why one of our readers has asked that is that they're actually thinking that it depends on the location of what I stored. There may be more restrictive rules than GDPR that they may need to deal with. Any thoughts on that? That is going to be one of the big questions about location. Is it specifically location where the data was collected? In other words, were you in an EU member state when you collected the data versus where the data is stored? Um, there's a number of, uh, the flip side of all this discussion, of course, is the legal ramifications. And that is one of the big questions that's come has come up, is physically if the data is stored in a European member state, does GDPR regulate? provide um, the coverage for that. As far as we can tell right now, it is the location physically of the servers that is going to be one of the determining factors as to whether it's covered by the regulation. Great, thanks. Uh, and as you noted, Don, the clock is ticking uh, to the beginning of GDPR enforcement and hopefully organizations are beginning to understand that there is a lot of ground to cover. In fact, as we mentioned at the beginning, our technology partner, Irwin, has a data foundation platform that we're looking at that allows for the sharing of any metadata across the entire enterprise. While we have shown Irwin EA Agile and the web portal data governance, there are several additional solutions that are coming together to make Irwin uh, a unified data management platform. As businesses need to evolve, Right? Uh, applications and business systems will need to become more transparent and auditable. Clients will need to leverage solutions like Agile EA, business process, data modeling to minimize risk and achieve compliance, not to mention some of the uh, supporting technologies from sample consultants uh, that will help us and following the CMI DMM uh, framework. Santo believes that it all starts with a comprehensive assessment of the potential impact and the realization that data is an organization's business and that business could be compromised by non-compliance. And that's where Santo can help. We believe that the approach to achieving compliance while reducing the risk of substantial financial penalties is a combination of the right people with the right processes and the right technologies at the right time. For an in-depth demonstration of any of the products we have discussed during the three webcast series, whether that be Irwin, Data Modeler, Business Process, Agile EA, or the Data Governance Web Portal, or if a client is interested in a CMMI DMM assessment or a data risk management assessment, or they're interested in establishing uh, enterprise management set of standards, are there interested in learning more about our uh, data governance capability delivery system, they can contact me at the email shown here. Now, as we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, for registration for all three events, uh, we have one uh, viewer uh, that's been selected, and that winner is Ian Nickel, and we'll be in touch uh, shortly uh, uh, to go uh, ahead and uh, provide Ian the uh, claim on the prize. So Ian will be in touch with you shortly. Uh, finally, 
Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for their time and look forward to hearing from uh, everyone in the near future. If people would like to uh, see the uh, part one and part two uh, GDR, uh, GDPR webcast, they can click on the links here or copy them and paste them into their browser. Or as I said earlier, visit our uh, YouTube uh, channel under Sample Consultants. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, speaking with you. And obviously, as Don said, there's uh, the time, the clock is ticking and GDPR regulation. We look forward to helping you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.